So moving ahead to our next session, which is called Driving Success, AI Strategies in Tata Motors Marketing Landscape. So for this very, very insightful session, may I request uh, Mr. Shubhranshu Singh, Chief Marketing Officer for Tata Motors CV Business to join us on stage. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Kosto. Uh, I don't know if I'll end up disappointing you, but my uh, talk today has nothing to do with Tata Motors as such. I was invited to speak on AI. But for those of you who go to conferences often, and I get to go quite often, there are two, three things that I have observed. One is there are conditions, I wouldn't call it a disease, but there are conditions that are quite manifest. One of them is uh, declare things deaditis, as I call it. Everything is dead. Marketing is dead. TV is dead. Print is dead. Funnel is dead. Direct marketing is dead. So this is sensationalism, which helps you to engage with the audience. The second frequently encountered problem is expertitis, as I call it, which is that everybody becomes an overnight expert expert the moment an invitation comes in you go and see two youtube videos or read one or two articles and then suddenly you're an expert especially if the subject is a newly minted subject in which case the audience won't know much about it in any case it's that much easier to become an expert and the third is futurism which is nobody is willing to put their neck out and speak about the next quarter the next month or the next year but everybody is delighted to speak about what will happen 15 years from now. Because as you know, in the long term, we are all dead. But in any case, even if you were predicting wrong things in 15 years time, the people who would remember, firstly, nobody would remember. And even if they did remember, you could say, but I also spoke about input conditions, etc., which changed over this period in time. So what I hope to do today is to, so I've been, my position here is none of the following. I am not an expert, although I am an observer and a practitioner and an end user. So I've been thinking about this, I've been writing about this, and thanks to people like Dun & Bradstreet, I get to present about it every so often. Uh, I am also uh, not going to declare anything dead because I have come to talk about something which is just getting born and, and being alive. And lastly, I'm not going to talk about the future at all. I'm going to talk about what has happened in the recent past and what's happening today. The One of the guiding uh, uh, traits of this phenomenon is that by the time I get done in the next half hour, the world of AI would have changed. So much of what I would say would become invalid by the time you guys finish lunch. Uh, so firstly, AI is not new and let the reason I'm referring to notes, usually I do gibberish quite well without referring to notes, but because this is a technically sensitive matter, I will refer to some. AI is not new. When, when you use your GPS to come here, or when your word processor prompts the next word, or if your fridge beeps, refrigerator beeps with some information, that is, for all intents and purposes, artificial intelligence at work. But the issue is that with the generalized environment which has got this huge novelty on account of generative AI. That has made people very, very curious. In my first job after engineering school, before I went to do my MBA, I worked with HCL HP and as a part of the management training program for the year, they put me in a shop for a few weeks in the M block market in GK in Delhi. And this was the year 98, 99, so people, uh, no, sorry, what am I saying, 96. So people were coming to see internet. And so whole families would come and say, humko internet dikha dijiye ji. And then I would dutifully put on the modem and it would, you know, I, for those of you who were alive back then, I see a young audience, it would go, krrrum, krrrum, you know, it would take a while to load up. And they would say, pintu aja, internet chalu hone wala. And then all of them were, you know, and then it would slowly load up line by line, a black and white screen of text, and they would say, hey, ye, ye internet hai. Yeah, sir, this is what it is. But then from that height of uh, expectation, it actually morphed into so many ways that are were inconceivable at that point in time. In fact, uh, we used to import Packard Bell 
home computers or put creative multimedia kits because our 19,999 computer wasn't groovy enough. So we used to jazz it up so that people could see some bells and whistles and imagine this. Now in AI, the fundamental issue is that the jazzing up is happening at a blinding pace. So man or society or even technical experts are not able to catch up with the development of it. But of late chat GPT, I'm sure everybody has seen is what is engaging people. So AI is not new. Uh, there was a paper published in 1948 called a mathematical theory of communication, which was almost prompting what is next in a sequence of letters. So those of you who have seen general intelligence tests, the adaptive part is to understand pattern and then predict what's coming next. Uh, and then Alan Matheson Turing very famously said a sentient uh, machine, whereas the machine would be able to conduct a conversation and then we are in the machine era. And from time to time, science fiction has actually blended into reality and reality has tended to look very much like science fiction. But I think in 2010, when we had Sophia, the, or Sophia, the humanoid robot, it, it, it made people believe that something physically tangible could arrive, which would be very human-like. And I don't, I mean, I think this is a part of human arrogance that we tend to believe something is superior when it, it is like us. I don't know why that arrogance should persist because in the machine era, we should acknowledge that the machine is likely going to be superior. And then of course, in 2020 with generative AI, uh, you know, it, it has thrown people uh, into, a, into the realm of asking the machine for what's next. Although with search engines and with things like Alexa, etc., uh, this was quite uh, established already. In fact, I'll give you a quick anecdote as I move to the next one. My son, who is now 15 years old and a very irreverent teenager, a few years ago, when he, I think just after COVID, when the school was still being conducted online and teachers were trying to gap, grapple with how to conduct a class on Zoom, they weren't paying much attention. So I told him one morning, his mother told me that he's not doing enough of homework, etc. And I was being the middle class father and telling him how I would get up at five in the morning and go for chemistry tuitions when I was preparing for the JE. And uh, he was lying on the sofa and next to him was Alexa. We had just got that. And then he said, Alexa, who is Subran Shu Singh? And Alexa said, sorry, I'm learning new things, but I don't know about this person. And he told me, he said, what a loser. Why did you have to get up at five in the morning? Uh, so we built this, humans have created this, but I don't think we quite understand this because the spectrum is from utopia to dystopia. And let me explain that. The conventional means by which we did things, right now I'm clicking, earlier I would, when I was a management trainee in Hindustan, we still had the acetate sheets on a projector on an OHP. And sometimes if you were adventurous and you forgot your acetate, it would actually physically melt on occasions and stick to the damn projector. But uh, this was the conventional view that things are manually done and machine takes over and automates it. And, and therefore there is great comfort for people in saying it's doing something that we command it to do. But in the world of AI, uh, the fundamental difference which will hit marketers perhaps hardest of all is that it is by definition fluid and dynamic. So it is doing things on its own and automation to intelligence. The missing link is that the machine itself is able to uh, understand what to do next. And by definition, therefore, it is unstable and human beings are very uncomfortable about unstable systems. Uh, human beings are generally anxious as well. In case you have not understood that, I request you to pay attention next time Indigo calls for its flight. Uh, even though they will be yelling it's zone 3, there will be at least 5 people in front of you who are zone 1. And then asking you whether it is zone 1 or zone 3. Uh, this kind of anxiety heightens when you get to machine error. Uh, human beings are also very afraid of human beings. So the thing that they again when you get off the indigo flight and climb onto a bus, the thing most people are trying to do is to avoid any kind of physical contact with another human being. Uh, I don't know what the problem with that is. But anyhow, so Henry Kissinger, who passed away at the ripe young age of 100 uh, last week, 
had written in, in his 98th or 99th year he understood about AI and he said that we are in the era when there is a possibility that every year the cumulative learning of all the past years will have to be revised. We are not used to that kind of revision. Uh, all of us know multiplication tables to 15, 16. If I were to ask you multiplication table for 382, naturally you will think I am a fool. But the machine doesn't care if you are asking it a multiplication table for 3,082. It will do it in a second and we are not used to this. And this came to life uh, with the Go challenge. So, Wei Qi, for those of you who are familiar with this Chinese board game, is by definition fluid. It has 180 or 181 pieces depending on who is going first. And you cannot have normative rules unlike for chess, you can't have rules for, uh, for Go because Go the game was designed to teach you how to play the game rather than playing the game. So it is a strategic game of encirclement. And uh, in 2016, uh, AlphaGo, a computer, beat Lee Sidol who was then the reigning world champion. and. Uh, it was only fed with the rules, the basic wireframe rules of Go. And then it played at the rate of millions of games at the quantum computing level with itself and taught itself Go better than the world champion. So, to uh, set this in the context of say chess, today at the level at which quantum computing is attempted uh, for AI master systems, if you were to teach a computer, the rules of chess that is fed in as code, it will then play with itself and within the span of an hour and a half or two hours, it will know more than 2500 years of chess development. Let that sink in and then in all likelihood it will play sequences or frames that have never been attempted by a human being in the past because human beings are only learning from uh, other chess players. By the way, uh, in I think 2019, the reigning Go world champion then beat the computer. But the question is, can we learn from the artificial intelligence system? And at the level at which they process information, it is very likely not to be the case. Now, as I spoke about, what is it? You know, if I give you a pen, <clears throat> you can draw better than me, you will draw better than me. If you can write poetry, you will write poetry. If I am literate, I will write my name or A, B, C, D. That is the functionality of the pen, but the manifold ways in which it multiplies is, is beyond our comprehension. So, if you, for example, know how to write Mandarin and I give you a ballpoint pen, the pen is an instrument, but you will be able to write Chinese characters, which I can't because I don't know the language. The computer doesn't have that problem. It will scrape from everywhere and it will learn Mandarin and produce those characters in no time. So, how does a human being compete with that kind of a thing? So, many experts have said that the last time such a change or an epoch happened was when the printing press was invented, the Gutenberg press in the 15th century. At that time, across the Christian world, across the modern world, the age of religion was the predominant age. So, everything was taboo. You, you had to adhere to a code. And what the printing press allowed to do was beyond what was liturgy, it printed things and made it accessible to people. Knowledge expanded, knowledge got codified. If you had the book and I had the book, both of us had access to exactly the same information which had never happened in the past because handwritten books were the preserve of the elites. So once that happened, you had expanding information in libraries and for many of us, I am 49, so when I was a kid, the dinosaurs were still roaming the earth. Uh, we used to, if you did well, I did well in class 7 and my grandfather bought me the Encyclopedia Britannica. I think it's still there in my family home in Jaipur. It was red and leather bound and uh, nobody, had, and nobody I knew had ever read it back to back. But everybody was very proud that, you know, somebody or the other had bought them the Encyclopedia. Today, the Encyclopedia gets done at the touch of a button several million times over. I'm just trying to give you a say, I'm, actually I think I'm doing a reasonably good job of scaring us all. But the future has arrived and again, uh, I'm not talking about the future, I'm talking about the present. Because this is now very much upon us, it is just not equally distributed. So how many of you had actually bothered about 
uh, artificial intelligence before this chat GPT adoption started. Sorry, could I just get a... Can you raise your hands and let me know how many had bothered to think about artificial intelligence before chat GPT? Okay, about two people in the back. Uh, I think he is from the organizers. He doesn't count his line. Um, so, the AI models that are winning are not commercialized. They are uh, developed in C2. This is the thing most people don't understand. The machine is developing stuff on its own. And that is really threatening to human beings. Now, let me get to AI in recent times. First of all, chat GPT, everybody knows had 100 million users in 60 days. But what people don't know is on the back of that, there was $40 billion of investment in the first five months of this fiscal year. A $40 billion is a lot of money operating on the same, in a sense, the same source code. And the way in which machine intelligence is, it has two parts. The primer is the code. In the case of chess, you, you code the rules in. And the second part is the data, which it then pulls and learns on itself by itself. That is the difficult part. And when stability AI raised funding, you see, you have to understand a, a large part of the development here has happened, I won't say illegally, but definitely under the radar. So there is a bona fide entity, which is a commercial entity. Then there is a not for profit entity. It is a research entity. It has vacuumed data from across the world, scraped your data. So for those of you who are happily saying, I accept cookies, thinking you'll get a biscuit, that data is now sitting with some large AI generator. It's gone. And that is why the Americans today have a huge advantage over, say, the Chinese, because the, the largest volume of internet accessible data is in English. So they have a lot of unstructured data to teach their own systems. And this data has been pulled out. And now, on top of that, they are doing generators like Studio. Now, if a machine is able to pass, pass the bar exam or win a, a global prize in art, you know, and that's already in the past, where will it go next? This is the question. Uh, what is the AI engine race? The AI engine race is basically that everybody right now is struggling to say, I also have a Me Too chat GPT. I mean, in, the, in our part of the world. Uh, of course, the Chinese have equally superior uh, core intelligence operating as AI, but they don't have as much data and they are now being choked from getting the microprocessors or the processors that are necessary to uh, enable those AI systems, which I'll speak about in a, in a moment. Now, when I sell technology to you, suppose I sell a truck to you, you are the physical operator of the truck. So, of course, with telematics and all, I have an ecosystem benefit. I can support you better. I can give you better warranty terms. I can tell you your engine oil is going or whatever, whatever. But when you are operating uh, open source, I'll get to in a second, but when you're operating a commercial process in AI, the tail is wagging the dog. You are part of that ecosystem, not the other way around. So that is the dif distinctiveness between automation and intelligence. And this is an important distinction that we will learn one way or the other. Now, the concept of best in class, when the AI learns, uh, say, you know, you're sitting on a chair and you think that the chair has no intelligence, which is a fact, it's a, it's a non-living thing. But if I were to take your intelligence or your knowledge as a proportion of the total intelligence or knowledge that exists in the universe, right? Then the chair and you are actually cousins because it's only a matter of what happens after the 30th decimal point, right? Because you, you know infinitely small portion of what the whole world or universe knows and your chair knows nothing but that is in relative terms more or less in the same zone. So our chair and we are as intelligent as each other. Uh, this is also true in computing versus a machine. And you know, the, the, in the rapidly evolving landscape of technology, they in turn help each other. And for those of us who are in competitive environments, we know that humans are not very good at helping each other. Uh, so, uh, and again, if you've been on an Indigo flight, uh, 
the, the existential fight for overhead baggage space. Uh, actually, I should not only say Indigo because I am from Tata. Any airline, as you get in, the fight for the overhead space is almost as if your, your survival on the planet depends on getting in first. Uh, and then I have noticed very often when the later guys come, they get up and see whether their suitcase has been displaced or not. Uh, so humans are worse off at collaborating than machines are. And machines can be programmed to collaborate. Humans are difficult to program that, that way. Now let's talk about the unstable nature. I have alluded to it. Uh, let me give you a quicker sense of it. Acquiring and analyzing new data happens in two ways. Say I meet you and you say your name is Sham. I say hello Sham, nice to meet you. Now I know you are Sham. But there are uh, 5 million other Shams in Greater Bombay. So I don't, next time, and there are very irritating sales people who call me all the time like this. Hello sir, this is Supratik. Now I don't know which Supratik, right? Uh, you remember I met you at the DNB, uh, whatever, seminar. So how are you today? And you know, then they generally want to have a conversation without giving any other context. So the machine understands that you are that sham, which human beings don't. Now it learns further that this sham is different from every other 5 million shams that they have met in the past and puts a marker on it. A human being, uh, it is impossible. And for those married men who forget their marriage anniversary, uh, you realize why our data fails after a certain while. In contrast to traditional automation, AI possesses the inherent capacity to reboot from the morning. Uh, let me give you a human example of this. You know, if you are very tired and you go, say you go to Vijayawada and you go and sleep in a hotel, it happens to a few of us, or maybe I am an exception, but if you wake up in the middle of the night and it's dark, you don't know where the loo is because you are used to the map uh, of going to the loo in your own master bedroom. And then some boot file kicks in and says, oops, I remember now I am in Vijayawada. This is not my house in Bombay. And then you are reliant on switching on the light or figuring your way out. Or if suddenly the room went dark and I had to grasp this bottle, I would grope for it because I know generally it is in this direction. But if you put me upside down and put me in Panvel, then I have lost track of where this is, right? So you don't have to go to Panvel. You take a map of India, turn it around and quickly try and locate your hometown. You will have difficulty doing that. Or if you remember that trick of, you know, how blue is written in red and then you're given a pressure test to quickly recognize the alphabet and the letter conflicts in, the color conflicts in your mind when you're reading out red because your brain is telling you red is that kind of red, but it's written in blue. So you get jammed. Well, the bad news is the computer doesn't get jammed. It is firstly billions of times faster than you and it does not make mistakes. And the other computer helps it in recognizing it, whereas in our case, they will only laugh at you when you make a mistake. So the capacity for self-learning and constant updation is something humans cannot match. Now let me get to the uh, economic impact. First of all, there is $100 billion in cloud computing spend in the world. There's $500 billion in digital advertising, give or take. And there is $5.4 trillion in e-commerce sales uh, as per IDC and Group M. I was at Cannes earlier this year and I, I had the chance to be in a, in a small group discussion where Sir Martin Sorel was giving generally uh, pessimistic outlook of the world as it is today. And he said there is no chance that a media planner who is 27, 28 years old can compete with the algorithm because it is simply physically not possible to have computing. So the only thing for which a human manager would be better off is to apply judgment. Now, in the AI age, the question is, what is judgment? Semantically, if, if I told you, Sham kicks the ball, and I told you the ball kicks Sham, you will say, nah, nah, the ball kicks Sham is simply invalid. Why? Because in the English language, you think ball is that spherical thing and Sham is the name of a person. It's a proper noun. But if I say I, I imagined uh, Mongolia and I said, you know, Khao Thu kicks Binjo, you have no clue what I'm talking about. Because it is possible that in Mongolian, the ball is called Binjo. Or let's paraphrase it in a spectrum now. If I say Sham kicks the ball, what is the ball? Is it that spherical object or is, is it the ball of a ball dance? 
or is it the ball of a chained wrecking ball technically you don't know so what we are doing is basically recognizing the pattern as per convention but you are clueless when i talk to you in finnish if i give you the same sentence in finnish you have no knowledge the computer knows it, it if it is if it has vacuumed finish it will know exactly which ball and every interpretation of the ball so the economic impact is that at the touch of a button you are getting fantabulously higher output why would you depend on a human being to do that now let's look at regulation one of the good things in the modern world is if thing if 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 governments are worried about regulation means ye cheez वैल्यूबल है इस पर रेगुलेशन आ गया एंड दिस इज वॉट इज हैपन इन अमेरिका यू मे नो प्रेजिडेंट बाइडन साइंड इन अबाउट आई थिंक अबाउट ट्वेंटी डेज अगो अ प्रेजिडेंशियल ऑर्डर अंडर द डिफेंस ऑफ यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स एक्ट सो द प्रोसेसिंग एंड रेगुलेशन पर्टिकुलरली ऑफ डीप फेक्स इन द यू एस इज नाउ एन एक्ट ऑफ नेशनल सिक्योरिटी एंड अकम्पनिंग इट सेल्स ऑफ थिंग्स टू पिक प्लेसेज लाइक चाइना एक्सेट्रा the uk also had a safety summit at bletchley park where they called 100 world leaders and elon musk was one of them so there is increasing amounts of regulation happening so what is the big tech challenge their business might suffer in a big way 300 billion dollars in annual revenue the the kind of processing that they do will not throw up enough new things which these ai startups so you may have microscopic startups which may be, become one fourth the size of google in 3 years and the tech world is not adapting to it fast enough and that reality is very possible certainly open ai with chat gpt's current levels of adoption is on its way to becoming a big tech place and the metaverse bet that had been made for meta or for verse Uh, could have been an ai bet as well i think they missed it by about 12 to 15 months so maybe they will regroup the big tech will also regroup and come back to it now let's look at i will skip through this i have already spoken about it basically it takes three things for a country to become a national ai power it takes people with intelligence and ability to understand the processing of the system or coding of the system it takes computing power so you you have to have a chef you have to have the pots and pans and then it needs to have the data as in the the res, the thing that goes into the recipe uh, america has an a decisive advantage on all three it is the headquarters of the world semiconductor uh, industry it has enormous talent which it vacuums in from all parts of the world and as i explained it has open access to the largest internet data pool that ever existed chinese are a close second they have uh, very good talent at hand they are able to um, put that expertise to work so their their uh, computing system which is treated at par at the highest level is called wu dao wu dao 2.0 and that's the beijing academy of artificial intelligence and in terms of computational complexity is rated as the best in the world but it doesn't have the data power doesn't have the ability to cook up enough this is the challenge that they face and where is india india's ability is i would say middle order right now in terms of talent and tech yes you know we are not barred so i guess we will get to chip environments and microprocessing capability uh, when it comes to data we are even further down and by the way china, another problem that china has is all of its open most of its open accessible scrape worthy data resides in places like baidu or you know so it is on apps it is not in the open internet so it it is not openly accessible for learning uh, so india is middle order but on the right side of the line so i would say we need to uh, go much faster now let me come to expression you know many of you would know there was a strike that lasted more than about 2 and 1/2 months in hollywood hollywood had come to a grinding halt why because they call sham and they take a body scan and they get him to emote like a screen test and after that they don't need sham technically speaking because the computer sham does a better good job and he works round the clock 24 hours a day for 365 days for 365 years if required and sham never dries he never gets freckles he never ages so that's it and then again if i take 
every single I, mean, I, I take meaning they've already taken if you if you scrape in pg wodehouse and you understand the semantics with which pg wodehouse wrote and if you have even little bit of humor you can create pg wodehouse by the second so the example that is given for this is monkeys with typewriters now imagine there is a monkey with a typewriter and it's going tick 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 it will every third or fourth time it may say something like b a t or you know whatever uh, l o v e whatever now imagine that this monkey is not one monkey but 600000 billion monkeys and or is one monkey with infinite time whichever way you want to do it so there is very good chance that by random typing he may produce all the works of shakespeare because we say no no it's not possible we say it because human beings are not able to get to what is probabilistically called p doom we are not able to calculate the probability of this kind of massive computation how can a monkey typing reproduce all of shakespeare because it's randomly likha hai but wo monkey ek nahi na fir 600 billion monkeys with infinite time there is very very good possibility that they will produce not only shakespeare but every literature known to man simply by random accident uh, this is the kind of multiplicative factor that will happen in the world of computation it's already happening so we have to and, a, and an algorithm will make cannon fodder out of your lifetime of work like this in a matter of seconds because it just scrapes who you are so if you think your credit card uh, uh, data that has been thieved and credit card fraud has happened to you you prepare for that at uh, at a universal scale uh, let's talk about ai and art generation now stable diffusion for those of you who know has about a crore users every day and it's increasing at the rate of uh doubling every 3 months now that art for a for a person to sit at an apple workstation and produce that takes several hours and there is a case which is being fought in fact yesterday i think was the hearing at open ai for what is called similitude so i take your work and i take every other work you have done and after that i produce replicas it is impossible to say which is real and which is not real and so it throws up the question of content ownership uh, there are several these image generators stable diffusion is the most well known mid journey is another one you cannot say that this is my work because it has not it has produced it of itself but it has sniffed you out completely so what is yours and what is not yours uh, is a question so we all go to the louvre in paris and see the mona lisa and the print out that we buy Uh, and hang in our drawing room is not the real mona lisa but in the digital world that distinction doesn't exist so how do we know which is real and which is not real uh, narrative building is another thing i am from rajasthan so if somebody comes here and says i am from rajasthan i say aha nice to meet you but imagine if i could vacuum information in this room and know not only that you are from rajasthan but you are from jaipur that you went to the same school that i went to that your uncle lives two houses away from my, and i knew that before i met you that kind of fore knowledge would give you a huge advantage and this is the kind of fore knowledge that let's say a political class would have now in connecting little isolated micro communities just in time for elections and this is another concern that is moving governments to look at regulation so with that i think uh, i come to the backers and detractors in popular literature it's called boomers and doomers doomers are those I, uh, horribly i sound like a doomer although i'm actually a boomer but uh, doomers are people who are saying this is it this is the end of the world and it is being helped by people like jeffrey hinton jeffrey hinton left google he was a leading ai practitioner and in his latest uh, prognosis he has said that if not immediately regulated across the world uh, by the way there is a 30% there is a 10% chance that humanity would be extinct in 30 years time now the question is again not that it's 12% chance or 50% chance or 8% chance the point is that if you leave it's like it's like a fire or debt if you leave one part unregulated it then spreads from there all over again so this is the probability of doom that people are talking about and then there is the future of open source ai so uh, traditionally we know we uh, coders tend to prefer open source they don't like big tech they don't like walled parks in this case open source is 
in many cases more dangerous or it is being qualified as more dangerous because open source invites people in to tinker whereas licensed and controlled is generated at an industrial scale or at an industrial level so open ai is a vivid example you you know that altman left the firm then was pulled back the whole board fiasco that happened in the last month was the genesis of it and the culmination of it was to do with safety who will guarantee that future versions of it are waterproof this is not known this is not understood well enough now uh, the thing that i should actually be qualified to talk about which is generative ai in marketing so uh, this is the hype cycle it always happens if you take the case of augmented reality uh, a few years ago everybody was talking about augmented reality glasses and so on and so forth and then it petered out because you have been there done that from that peak of expectation it did not go into very many new directions uh, there are two things that happen at the peak of inflated expectation either things multiply or things collapse clearly in the case of television in the case of the development of the internet from when i was at the hcl store things multiplied and had myriad expressions there are things which go kaput it was good it lasted for a while you may remember the segway which was a standing cycle kind of a thing which was meant to transform urban transportation a uh, few policemen are riding it in europe i was there recently and you know they in airports and all you see them but it didn't it didn't flourish at all so the hype cycle is at its peak uh, i am i am no judge of what will happen next but certainly the way in which uh, things are multiplying commercially available and accessible plus open source uh, i won't say I mean, tools is not the right word to say in oi but open source platforms predict that there are enough people with enough money to keep this going now whether it's open ai hugging face light tricks jasper glean you just have to ask chat gpt and it will tell you but uh, there is uh, every new system is improving itself because of commerciality every new system is improving itself because the system is improving itself as well that is the more powerful thing okay uh, so what all does it do the use cases are flourishing that peak of expectations tends to grow if use cases are flourishing and the use cases are flourishing on expression on imagination on visualization on application and use and on synchronicity as well so i make something and every other person gets to have that hi rudra every other person gets to know that and multiply it many times bigger and better so this ai bias is inherent in the system like i said if i said you know if there was a rule that we would get a 10% tax break depending on what color of hair you have uh, i may have another problem that is i may not have hair left by the time that rule comes in but uh, i would naturally vote for black hair because that's a inherent bias i want people with black hair to have a better deal uh, the the bias can be coded and the bias is assimilative so the system decides that you know or if i realize that being polite to this guy gets me better lunch i learn as human beings jugar that you know i should be continuously polite to him the system tells you know tell it reinforces it mutually so it tells each other this is beyond our comprehension but it's happening and that systemic bias if it is programmed at the algo level and if it is fake is un in, uh, in uh, you know not being able to distinguish between fake and real and there is an inherent plug that that injects bias and there is unprecedented data processing capability well then you are living in a world which is completely biased but seemingly completely true and this is not something that we have encountered only as children when we went to an amitabh bachchan movie and you came out for about 5 minutes you thought you were amitabh bachchan till your mother scolded you and then you were back to being whoever you were but uh, the, the the reality of the system i think this is a, a mechanized way of telling me to shut up and get lost because i'm well over my time in any case uh, but this is a problem this is a big problem uh, content ownership i've spoken about nobody owns it everybody owns it but the one who is able to vacuum in the most owns the most so it is a multiplicative and reinforcing system one is the same as the other everything that you know possess or are can be replicated in an infinite portion of a second technically it is possible 
uh, your data is getting scraped all the time and again regulation is focusing more on the the potential of it so the problem with human regulation is we have not encountered ai so we only see the what not the how much there is a crucial difference what should be done what should be regulated not what is the risk and therefore how much so is deep fake a bigger concern for certainly for politicians and film stars it is but for me and you our meager savings and our financial information is a bigger concern i mean frankly i'd be quite flattered if somebody took my body scan and was multiplying me all over the world you know i, I would be very happy with it unfortunately no such luck uh the regulation space i don't know why this is uh are we being able to verify things verification is the touch test that human beings applied what is verification in the ai age there is no equivalent of verification that is why everything that we say is a certified bona fide government regulated i attest that he is mohit from dun and brad street because he gave me a card and i believe him but in a multiplicative system there are now a million it's like you know the indian mythology where everywhere you are looking you see the same thing and then how, who is to verify where is the verification engine in this so this is a big problem and uh, i would say in in closing should we be worried about it or should we be as 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 professional observer marketer i would say for me it makes professionally life much easier today i have to make a campaign i write a brief i send it to an agency i brief my team they ideate they come up with an idea so what is being regulated in my son's case for homework i would actively encourage in terms of the kick off of ideas because it just throws in new dimensions but from there i have also a, fidu- a custodial responsibility for the brand for its manifestations for its dna and that is a risky thing because you know if if that goes uncontrolled and can be uh sucked out of my system and there is no great gate protocol then that's a very very uh, big risk the small can become big the very next instant and the big can be multiplied in unintended ways the very next moment so i have not spoken about uh you know the 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 risk of somebody getting source code for how to make a bomb or how to make a new viral strain but all of these are also uh um, frankly things for president biden to worry about but uh, i think as a whole as humanity we should be optimistic on the on the delivery side of it and we should be cautious on what is happening to us as individuals because unless there is a social recognition like it's like environmental concern uh, if it's taught in school if it's ingrained then it becomes social code otherwise it's somebody's hassle he just doesn't like smoke i don't know why this is not the problem needs to be addressed more deeply that's all i had for you today thank you very much for your time thank you so much mr singh wasn't that an absolutely amazing session right are we ready for more of these can we have a huge round of applause for mr singh honestly i could hear him talk for another hour i wouldn't get bored right i just walked up all the way to the front because of that and uh, now may i request <clears throat> mr mohit gupta senior director of sales at dunn and bradstreet india to hand over a memento to